the event House of the Lord. All right, that's our first song, House of the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, we thank you for the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this house. We can come and worship you. And glorify your mighty name. Hallelujah.
I sing for, for all you've done for me. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, I want to thank you right now. And right now, Lord, even last night, I'm just praying and thinking about our brothers and sisters, the believers in Ukraine right now. And I'm sure right now they are in those, there's a place, I'm sure, wherever they are, that they are worshiping. And I'm sure they're singing this song as well. This is an amazing grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you, Lord, because whatever things that surround us, that happen surround us, Lord, that we can continue to worship you. Because nothing changed in your plans. Nothing changed, Father God, of what you have purposed. And so therefore, we continue to worship you. Regardless of the storms of life, regardless, Lord, of what we are going through and our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are going through. I just want to thank you right now for them, strengthen them, encourage them, Father God, to persevere in their faith with you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. The Lord praise Amen. for giving deliverance. I love you, O oh Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Amen. Amen. That's right. Thank you, Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust.
of it all, heaven and earth, your Lord of all, be worshipped.
this morning. Some good stuff. Yes? So, scriptures, some, some very, some re really powerful prayers there and, and, and things said. Please God. Spot on. All right, so Matthew chapter 9, part 3, and it's healing the sick and raising the dead. Now, these are very well known to us, I'm sure, right? You know the story of the woman with the issue of blood and the, and the raising of Jairus' daughter, don't you? And I was talking to someone last night, and I said, how am I supposed to 
This could take oh, quite a while to go through. This sounds bad, doesn't it? Um, this could take a while to go through. How are we supposed to do it? And I was told, well, maybe you should separate them both. But the fact of the matter is that these two stories are intertwined. They're joined together and you can't really have one without the other. So we are looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to start with. Uh, so I just have to turn there. Had it all marked by putting this page into it. Um, okay. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. And knowing Jesus has been doing a lot of ministry around the area and casting out devils, and there was the calling of Matthew. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, we read these words. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now, at this stage, you probably know that <coughs> Matthew is good at skimping on the details. He has committed just about, what is it, nine verses compared to Luke's, uh, Mark's gospel. This is getting worse now. <laughs> Mark has 23 verses, and... Um, and then Luke has six, 17 verses. So now this is just getting really bad. All right, testing one, two. We might have to start all over again for that reason. Okay, no, we're not going to start all over again. We're just going to continue on. So we have Matthew has given the whole story of two miracles in simply uh, nine verses, whereas Mark has given it 23 verses and Luke has given 17 verses. So the reason is, is because Matthew has been speaking to a different audience. He's trying to give it the barest details as is necessary just to get to the point he's speaking to the Jewish people. And so that's his audience. But if we wanted more details, we all would have to do is go to the other gospel. Isn't that good that we have both Mark and Luke to back it all up? And you have to do a lot of flipping and tossing back and forth. Now, I didn't want you to do that sitting with your Bible going, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all through this message, because it would take a lot of work, okay? We try to put as much of it as possible on the screen. But the idea is that if you want the details, you're going to have to do a bit of homework. That is with any Bible study. Don't just say, I want someone to do it for me. You've got to sometimes go into this. Now, what we read here simply is these words, right? While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came. Now, that's all it says, a ruler. That's it. A ruler came and worshipped him, saying, my daughter has just died. But he seems to have this belief that if you could just come and lay your hands on her, she will live. What does he believe? Does he believe in a miracle that can happen? It seems like it. But she's just died. And yet, if you would lay your hand on her, she will live. So Jesus said, right, I'll go with you to your house. Now, what we'd have to do is go over to Mark's gospel, chapter 5, and we'll see a bit more of, of the information. Here we read, in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, listen to this, one of the rulers of the synagogue. So he wasn't just a ruler, but he was one of the rulers of the synagogue. Came Jairus, we're even getting the guy's name, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. So is she dead or is she at the point of death? Ever think about that? He says here, she's at the point of death. In other words, if she's so sick, she's about to die. And I need you to get to my house as soon as possible. Because if you can get your hands on her, she will be healed. She will live. If only we can get Jesus to get there soon, right? That's where his faith's at. She's at the point of death. She's about to die. Then, of course, if we go over to Luke's gospel, chapter 8, uh, we'll read uh, this extra piece of information just to fill in the blanks okay where are we it was in verse 40 um so it was when jesus returned that the the multitude welcomed him for they were all waiting for him and behold there came a man named jairus 
And he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter. This is not just a daughter, but his only daughter, an only child in some translations. She had an only child or an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. So in other words, she hasn't dead yet. She's at the point of death. What we need you to do, I believe that Jesus, you have the power to heal. And if I can get you to my house, why well, I believe that God can work a miracle through you. Amen. How many of you think that the man had faith for that kind of thing that we've seen and heard of all the miracles that Jesus can do? He can heal the sick. He can do all kinds of things if we can get Jesus to the man, to the place on time. Now, by the way, a ruler of the synagogue. Do you know what the ruler of the synagogue was responsible for? He's responsible for the upkeep of the synagogue. He decides who's going to be the speaker that day, who's going to be uh, reading the texts. And he may have even been the very guy that Jesus, remember in Luke chapter four, it says he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and he handed it back to the attendant. Well, this probably is the guy who's involved in the synagogue and was giving out the scriptures and things like that and that Jesus handed it back to him. So a ruler of the synagogue, that's all he is. But he's so desperate for a miracle that he's coming and he's throwing himself down at Jesus' feet and worshiping him and just pleading and begging Jesus, would you just please come to my house? And what did Jesus do? He said, I'll go to your house. Yes, I'm ready to go with you. Amen. That's part one of this whole story, okay? And so all you have to do is get there and be there on time. And hopefully there won't be any delays along the way. All right. So then we need to go back to Matthew and pick up the story with Matthew's chapter 9. And this is from verse 20 to 22. Okay? So I have to find the place with again one time. Um, so where are we? And suddenly... A woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Once again, Matthew has left out quite a number of details, hasn't he? Because we don't know much about the woman's medical history, who she is, where she's come from, anything about her from Matthew's gospel. It simply was that this woman had had some sickness for how long? 12 years. How old was the girl who had died? She's 12 years as well. Interesting that the number should come up. I don't know why. We're not told why. But it seems to, that for the same length of time that that woman was sick is the length of that girl had lived her life. 12 long years. And so we're not told much about her except that she had a flow of blood. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on that in a moment. But first of all, again, we have to go back to Mark's gospel to the same place where we were, where we were before. And this is chapter five again. And what happened? We pick it up uh, in verse 25. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, and listen to this, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So she didn't have a lot of confidence in the doctors, would you say? Yeah, she, I don't know what all she'd been through. They probably said, try this remedy, try that remedy. There's so many different promises that were given to her that if you would try my news thing and this will work for you, it's worked wonders. And all these promises just never seemed to work. And in fact, she was not getting any better, but rather grew worse, okay? When she heard, now she did hear some report about Jesus. There's this guy walking around, a miracle worker. When she heard the reports about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, I don't know what gave her that idea that there's some guy going around called Jesus and he's working miracles. But if I could just lay hold of his garments, the hem of his garment, I shall be perfectly made whole. That's what she thought anyway. And so we go over to Luke's gospel once more to chapter eight. And we fill in a little bit, bit more of the blank because we read. Uh, where are we? 
It's hard to find it sometimes. Verse 41 and uh, yeah. So now a woman, 43. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. So here's a woman that she said, okay, I've got this thing. I've tried everything. I've lost all my money, spent it on all these physicians, all the promises, all the cures, and not one single one of these physicians is able to cure her. In fact, isn't it interesting that look, the beloved physician, according to Colossians chapter uh, four, verse 14, he's in the Bible called, look, the beloved physician. He might have been able to cure her or do something for her, but it says that she'd gone to all types of doctors. She'd been to them all. She'd been to as many as she could and spent everything she had on them, but not one of them could bring her any cure. And she's getting fed up with the doctors at this stage. But then has she given up hope? Has she given up hope altogether? Probably in the medical profession, she's given up all hope of them being able to do anything for her. But then she heard about the reports of Jesus. Now, the thing about it is she has a flow of blood. We're not told exactly what it is, okay? It could have been that she was just drained from some um, medical thing and, or some physical problem. We are not told exactly, some kind of a hemorrhage, okay, that we're told about. But we are told that back in Leviticus chapter 15, if you want to have a look over there, that there were rules concerning the the what people who had any kind of a discharge, a hemorrhage, were supposed to do. So uh, Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 uh, to 27, it says this, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. She shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And whatever she sits on shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her impurity. Whoever touches those things shall be unclean. He shall wash his, his clothes and bathe in water and be clean, unclean until evening. Now, we're not told the exact details of what this was, but she is probably feeling absolutely drained because of this discharge or this blood flow of blood that she has. And not only that, not only is she feeling totally drained, but socially she's an outcast. She can't even mix in the crowds with people. She can't go to the temple and pray or do any of those things because she is a social outcast. She's ritually unclean. And if anyone was to come in contact with her, they would also be ritually unclean. So she's not supposed to mix in the crowds at all. But then if she's heard the reports about Jesus, what is she supposed to do? Because she sees a big crowd gathering around Jesus and she thinks to herself, this could be my chance. I could slip into this crowd and get in there really close to Jesus, a bit like a pickpocket, and I could just steal a miracle. I could just get up really close behind him, just touch, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be completely whole. Now, why would she think that if I touch the hem of his garment, I should be whole? Is there something about the tassels on the garments of the Israelite people? Yes. There's a, there's a commission or a commandment in the Old Testament. You'll find it in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 12, and Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41. I'm just going to read to you one of those parts because there's, there's, there's a lot to read there. But Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 12. Um, let's see if I can find that one single-handedly. 22, verse 12. It says, you shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. Now, so this means that around the borders of the clothes of the Israelite people, they were to sew on these tassels. Now, that means to say that, that Jesus probably was wearing what's called a prayer shawl. Now, we have pictures of this because there are some people who thought that what this woman did is she got really down low, as low as she got, possibly could get, and she crawled along the ground, and she was basically trying to grab onto the hem of Jesus' garment. But more than likely, it was the shawl that was put over his, over his left shoulder that she got in the crowd, and she just touched that. It doesn't say she pulled on it. She grabbed hold of it. It just says, all she said, if I could just touch that, 
I know there would be healing for me. I would be completely made whole. Now, has anyone ever been uh, or experienced a pickpocket before? Anyone here ever been pickpocketed before? You can hardly feel it. I remember it because we were in the in Bogota, Colombia. You have? No, you were Okay, well, in Bogota, Colombia, yeah, I was there and I felt a tugging on my trousers in the crowd, and it was a big crowd, massive big crowd. And I was going up the stairs and crowds were coming down the stairs, and I felt this pulling on my trousers, and I thought. Okay, that's Nympha. She's trying to grab hold of something just so she doesn't get lost in the crowd. So she she's uh, grabbed on to me. She grabbed onto my pocket like this and she's holding on. Well, what did I do? I got her by the hand and said, Oh, come on. <laughs> I, I drag, I literally dragged this person all the way up to the top of the stairs. And I went, turn around and went, Who are you? Uh, it was some some um some woman from uh, Colombia. Uh, oh, well, there is some similarity, but it wasn't her. Okay, so I thought, well, oh, sorry, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And so I let her go. Then I said, oh, there's Nympha down at the bottom of the stairs. I'll be back down in a second. So I go down and I feel more of this sort of like this. And, I, and it wasn't even then. I didn't even realize that it was a pickpocket. How dumb can I be? Like, seriously. It was only later that we discovered that there was someone who had been dipping into people's uh, handbags and stealing things that it was, I went, oh, that's what it was. But it just shows you how, how they can be so quiet, so swift and so um, soft in their touch. But this is what this woman seems to be doing. In my mind, she's, in, she's thinking, I can slip into this big crowd here. All I gotta do is just touch the hem of his garment and I know I will be instantly healed. She had faith in something there. And so this is where we pick it up in the story. I'm sorry if it's uh, taken a little bit long to get through all that, but we just wanna lay the foundation. So what happens is, if you go back to Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, we read the following, it says 9, chapter 9, verse 20, and suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem, that is the tassels on the garment, of his garment, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well, well what did Jesus do? It says in Matthew, he turned around. He basically felt that something had happened. He turned around in the crowd and he basically caught her in the act, didn't he? He caught her as she was trying to sneak away, totally whole, totally made well, and he caught her in the act. So basically, we read that, and again, go over to Mark's gospel. It says, what happened? Immediately, this is what happened. She touched him, and verse 29, Mark 5 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. So she felt immediate healing. It wasn't a gradual thing. It was immediate, wasn't it? And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? So he felt something flowing from himself. Now, we don't know what he knew in his uh, humanity. I mean, in his, in his divinity, Jesus is omniscient, doesn't he? Knows all things. But what he knew that day, we're not sure. He turns around and asks, who was it? that? Can you imagine him doing that? Who touched? Who was it that touched me? And uh, again, if you go over to Luke's gospel, chapter 8, we read a little bit more detail on that. Uh, <clears throat> where are we? Verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? Because immediately her flow blood stopped. And, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? Can you imagine the disciples seeing Jesus surrounded by all these crowds of people? And he says, who touched me? And they're saying, oh, come on, Jesus. Like, seriously, they're all touching. They're all rubbing shoulders with you. And you're asking, who touched you? And he says this. He says, no, but I know that somebody has, and there's a verse there from the New Living Translation, somebody has deliberately touched me. Deliberately. In other words, they have a reason for touching me. They did, deliberately touched me, and I felt power, healing power, go out of me. It says here, uh, verse 46, but Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, 
she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. So praise God. Can you imagine him just saying, just stop everything, stop the whole crowd here. I know that somebody out here, one of you says, touched me. Who was it? And this woman is trying to sneak away. She comes back, but it's important. He's not trying to embarrass her. What he's trying to do is say, she needs it needs to be publicly known that she's clean and that she can reintegrate into society we need her to have a public testimony and she does that but she comes fearing and trembling i just can picture her sort of all shaken up and what is she afraid of is she afraid that i've done something wrong you see if you were in the crowd that then you're a jewish person and there was an unclean person there you would be very upset that some unclean person was going to contaminate you or anybody around you that was just not on you can't be doing that you shouldn't even be allowed out in public and not only that but to touch your clothes that would con uh, contaminate you and yet was jesus contaminated by the woman's sickness no but something of him flowed out there you know there's a, a, a spiritual lesson here as well i hope you can see it is that we come to jesus christ in our uncleanness don't we we come to him with sin and uncleanness there's something not right with us we are fallen human beings and no matter how evil no matter, no matter how sinful no matter how bad our sin is toward God, you know what can happen? It doesn't make him sinful. It doesn't affect him in that way. But his virtue, his power flows out to touch us and changes us. Amen. The moment, the instant that you call upon the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, that instant, you are instantly cleansed and healed of your spiritual problem. But also God can heal the sick, obviously, as well. But how many of you, the moment that you called upon the name of the Lord, you could say, I knew that my sin was washed away, cleansed, and I am a brand new person in Christ Jesus. Does anyone ever experience that? Yeah. Amen. That's what's supposed to happen. That Jesus Christ is the healer and also the savior. Amen. So the thing about it is there's another reason why Jesus couldn't just let her slip off into the crowd. One reason would be this. Could it be? that she would go around telling people, I touched the magical coat. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible because there are so, so many superstitions and there were later, uh, later in uh, Mark, Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, it, we read that there in verse 36, that there were other people who touched Jesus to be healed. But there are some people who would just say, I just touched the magic. He must be wearing some sort of a magical coat. And that's why he was healing people. But he wanted her to know, no, it wasn't that. Because he has to speak these words to her. And it says in Matthew, it, and he wants to make it clear that it was his words. He says to her, go back to Matthew. What does he say to her? He says, but Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. It was through his words that she spoke. he spoke. And not only that, he's calling her daughter because he's recognizing in her the same kind of faith. Remember when he spoke to the man who was um, paralyzed and he says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. The same type of thing. There's a kind of an attitude toward the person that says, you're a child of God. You have real genuine faith, not just healing faith, but saving faith also. That seems to be implied in these words. Daughter, your faith has made you well, and it's going to keep you well as well, because you're free from your scourge. You're free from your torment. You're free from your affliction forever. That's what it says in the other Gospels, Matthew, uh, Mark and Luke. Amen. Now, all of this is very good. You could be saying, this is great. A woman has been healed. It's tremendous, wonderful story. But somebody might be not so happy. And who would that be? Jairus, because he's watching his watch, he's looking at his clock, saying, come on, like, come on, how long is this going to go on for? The woman's not giving a full testimony of what she's been going through, her whole life story. We don't need to hear all that. If I could get Jesus to my home as soon as possible, but now there's this delay. And was there a delay? There yeah, certainly was. And Matthew doesn't go into the details. All he says here is that the woman was healed from that hour. Uh, when, verse 23, when Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wheeling. He said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all that land. What bits of information has Mark, uh, Matthew left out? Well, there is 
both in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, the fact that there was a person who came from Jairus' household with some bad news. You read this in Mark chapter 5. It says, listen to this. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? What's that sound like to you if you were hearing that? Unbelief. Well, it's like this, forget about it. You've done your best. You tried to get Jesus to your house. You were always going well, but it's too late now, and there's so there's a limit to a person's faith. And maybe you can say, I believe God can do so much. I believe he can heal, but like this is going too far now because this man who's come back with this report is saying, just don't trouble. Is it any trouble to Jesus Christ? Is it any trouble to the Lord? This man said, why trouble? Why put him to all that bother of coming to your house? Your daughter is dead. Just forget about it. And then what would have happened if you or I had been there? Our faith would have been completely drained from us. And, you know, just feel like just deflated. Hope is gone, right? What does Jesus do? I don't have to read it from both of these because it says the same thing in each. It says Jesus heard the same thing, heard the same report. As soon as Jesus, verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, to Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. Amen? In Luke's gospel, basically he says the same thing. It says, but when Jesus heard it, he answered said him saying, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. That's verse 50. So in other words, he could be saying to Jairus, keep the switch of faith turned on. Keep her lit. Don't let go of your belief because you may have been told some bad news and you may feel like, oh, dashed. Your whole hopes are all dashed, but just don't give up, okay? And he's, because fear could take over, couldn't it, at any moment? He says, do not be afraid. Keep on believing and your daughter will be made well and she will be made well. Isn't that great news? Well, all we got to do then is get Jesus to the house. And of course, when you get to the house, what happens at the house? Well, Matthew skipped on the details, but when you get there, you've got the fact that there is already preparations have all, I mean, didn't take that, these people long, did it? I mean, they've already got a crowd. They've already got wheelers. And it says that there was a noisy crowd. I'm, I prefer to say a nosy crowd, but there was a noisy crowd gathered already. And there were flute players. Now, according to the Mishnah, um, it is said that every household in Israel, if they ever had a funeral, even the poorest of the pe poorest are to have at least two flute players and one wailing woman. That's the limit. That's what you, that's required. But so the fact that he has a noisy crowd and some flute players may suggest that Jairus was a bit better off than others and he could afford a bigger crowd. Who organized all this? Well, Jairus just went down the road to get Jesus. The next thing come back and you got a whole big crowd of people and they're making a noise. We read this. It says, when he came into the house, uh, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John. So Peter, James, and John, the three closest to Jesus were allowed, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. And there, of course, there was the, the flute players and the noisy crowd. All of that was going on. Jesus has to wade through all of that unbelief, all of that wailing and all that crying and flute players, and walk into the death chamber of a little girl who's just died. Okay? And it says... He, they all were weeping and mourning for her. And Jesus makes this outlandish statement. What does he say? I mean, can you imagine it in a, at a funeral? Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. Uh, well, we says here, and they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. So they knew better than Jesus did, didn't they? Now, it could be possible. Some people have suggested that maybe she was sleeping. Maybe she was in a coma. How many think she was only in a coma? I don't think so. You know why? Because we'll, there's a lot of facts that suggest that she was really dead. But they said, oh, he thinks she's just in a deep sleep. How dumb of him. You know. But he comes in there and he simply says these words. Do not weep. She's not 
dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him to uh, ridiculed him and knowing that she was dead. Verse 54, this is Luke chapter 8. But he put them all outside. He had to get rid of all that unbelief. Took her by the hand and called saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned. Now the spirit returning would give you an indication that she was dead, wouldn't it? Okay, her spirit returned and she arose immediately and he commanded that she be given something to eat. You know what's happening here? He, for, for Jesus to raise the dead is so simple. But listen to what he said again. She's not dead, but sleeping. Is death the finality for the Christian? No. no. And is sleep a, a term that is used by Christians for death? Yes. Okay, remember that in John's gospel, chapter 11 of Lazarus, when, when Jesus was told what happened to Lazarus, what did he say? Our friend Lazarus is sleeping. And they went, oh, well, if he's sleeping, he'll go, he'll wake up. And he says, oh, okay. Shh. Look, okay, I'll tell you plainly, Lazarus is dead, okay? But that's a way of us Christians is showing that death is not the final story or the final, the, the final of all the Christians, right? Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you're probably familiar with this. Listen to this from the Apostle Paul. And I just want to read a few verses from 18 to 20. It says, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Is there anyone who has fallen asleep in church? <laughs> it's not only about those people. It's not only about those who have died, who are trusting in Jesus Christ. They have fallen asleep. And so... God, listen to this, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, how many are familiar with that verse that tells you what we should be as believers believing? 1 Thessalonians, if I can find it, um, just before the Timothys. All right, listen to this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, we don't want any ignorant brethren here either, do we? Okay. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. You know what's going to happen? Even the dead are going to be awakened with a large and sounding alarm clock. It's going to be a trumpet, actually. He's going to say, it's time to get up. And it's going to be awakening just like that. We who are trusting in Jesus Christ, even if we die, we're not dead in the same sense as the world is dead because we are simply like sleep now we're not talking about soul sleep here we're just talking about the fact that we're seen as sleeping that's why when you go to a funeral and you see someone lying in a coffin it looks like they're sound asleep because that's how it's going to be now in this story with the raising of lazarus you know what it, not lazarus the raising of Jairus's daughter jesus walks into that room and he says she's not dead but sleeping and just to prove it you know what he simply does he just steps up and he says little girl get up and it's just like her mother would have called her in the morning and said little girl child get up it's time for your breakfast that's exactly what he was doing just like that get up it's time to get your breakfast because we read that that's exactly what she, then her spirit returned and she arose immediately and he com he commanded that she be given something to eat and her parents were astonished but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Amen. What a tremendous story. He can raise the dead as simply as that. And you know what? It's not just for this girl in the story. It's for every one of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ. He will awaken us. He will raise us up together with him, uh, to, to, with all the believers, that is, with him, to be with him in the air. Amen? Amen. So praise God. All we have there in Matthew is the simplest of the story. And in Mark's gospel, again, it finishes off with this story. We'll just read the last piece. And, and they 
Verse 40, and they ridiculed him, but when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement, but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Now you might wonder, well, why would he uh, command them, tell nobody about this? Ever wonder about that? Well, you, sometimes if you tell people what not to do, they'll go and do it anyway, won't they? <laughs> don't do it. Oh, well, we're going to tell everybody. But it also could be, he says, don't make a big fuss and make this little girl the center of attention of all these people. Just give her something to eat and keep these things to yourself. Or it could simply be, don't tell them all the details of what happened in that bedroom and how I raised her from the dead. Just, just get on with loving your little girl and enjoying life. Amen? But the whole point is that news of this Going back to Matthew and finish with this, Matthew chapter 9, it simply finishes this episode by saying, and they ridiculed him, but when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went out into all that land. Praise God. That's the whole point of these kind of miracles, that the reports, the testimony of what Jesus Christ can do. What can he do? He can not only heal the sick, but he also raises the dead. There's nothing impossible to this Jesus Christ. It's not through a magical touch, though. It is through the touch of holding on to Jesus by faith. And you touch him with your faith. It wasn't, a, if I could have touched that clove that day, if I could touch him, if I could only grab hold of his garment today, you don't need to touch his garment. You need to touch him with your faith. It is your faith. Jesus didn't say your touch has healed me, uh, has healed you. He says your faith is what made you well. And it's your faith that Amen. will do the same thing today. Amen. We're going to close. Uh, we've gone on long enough. Uh, hopefully this has been a blessing to you all. And then to see Jesus Christ and who he is and all of his power and all of his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Are you going to do a song with us?
your words today, oh God. As just Jesus has told to this woman, it is your faith that made you whole. And I just pray, Father, right now. I just pray, Father, right now that we continue, Lord. Just your word said, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. And we will continue, Lord, to have that in our hearts, oh God. And Lord, I believe. I will continue to believe to the ends of the earth, Father God. I will continue to believe that your word is true and that your word is the one that will set us free. And it is your word, Father God, that will make us whole. And we just want to thank you for your words today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen.